Hi everyone, we are at the Rhode Island Agricultural Experiment Station at the University of Rhode Island. My name is Sarah and in this virtual field day I'm going to tell you about some research we've been doing on a leafy green called amaranth. Here on the screen are just a few of the kinds of amaranth we've worked with here at URI over the last two years. Amaranth leaves are eaten in over 50 countries around the world and reaching diverse customers is one of the major appeals from a marketing standpoint. Amaranth leaves are super nutritious and, as you can see, sometimes really interesting visually. So both of these traits may be useful in marketing as well. Amaranth has been understudied for intensive production, and this is especially true in temperate climates. So to begin investigating amaranth as an alternative crop for growers in southern New England, we completed two projects in 2016. First were variety trials. We wanted to investigate some varieties that span the wide range of appearances and growth habits you see here. Amaranth is a C4 photosynthesizing plant, so it likes high heat. In the variety trials, we use low tunnels like these to maximize heat. We grew 10 varieties and recorded yield and biomass leaf to stem ratios for each throughout the 2016 season. For the second stage of research in 2016, we used two of these varieties and began investigating the best production system for amaranth in the northeastern temperate climate. Over three plantings, we compared yields from four production systems and observed a clear pattern for the two varieties that maximized heat led to maximized yield. Even though our low tunnel plots consistently had the highest yields, we couldn't necessarily recommend low tunnels as the optimum production system for two reasons. First, the cost-benefit analysis for these production systems will depend on existing supplies, production strategy, and the market price for amaranth, which is not well established. Second, analysis of the variety trials give us good reason to suspect that the response to modified air and soil temperatures might be more variable than was reflected by just these two varieties. In the variety trials, we used the same methods on all 10 varieties, but we learned that targeted production and harvesting strategies would likely be beneficial in getting the most out of these plants. So this takes us to our 2017 season of research. This season, we tested four varieties in three production systems, low tunnels with black plastic mulch, black plastic mulch with no crop covers, and bare soil. The varieties were chosen to represent varying growth habits, appearances, and cultural associations. And I'll share some targeted strategies for each kind as we go. I'll start with a variety called Red Callaloo. In last year's trials, this variety really underperformed in leaf to stem ratio, as did a variety called Green Callaloo. A marketing note to think about here, in Caribbean cultures, this kind of amaranth is cooked, both leaves and stems, in a dish called Callaloo. High leaf to stem ratio is a desirable trait for most leafy greens, but if a customer is planning to use the stems, a low leaf to stem ratio may not be a deal breaker. We wanted to include one of these tall stemmy varieties in this year's research because they have specific cultural associations and to see whether leaf to stem ratio could be improved. So here is a red callaloo plant a week after transplanting. In a little satellite plot of eight plants, we pinched the tops of four plants a week after transplanting. We counted leaf and branch number each week, and here are the results. You can see a clear and steady increase in branches and leaves after pinching. Furthermore, at four weeks after transplant, the no-pinch plants were flowering, and the pinched plants were not. And here is a visual comparison at three weeks after transplant. You can clearly see the difference between the plants that were not pinched and those that were. There's no one right way to harvest amaranth, but a couple things to keep in mind for tall, stemmy varieties like this. Number one, it is very windy on our farm, and breaking of central stems is definitely an issue. It's amazing how these guys keep growing when attached by so little tissue, but early harvest to encourage that lower branching is a good idea. Number two is that if you cut too far down the central stem on your first harvest, you won't leave enough photosynthesizing leaves for the plants to quickly recover and grow back to harvest ready again. So after some experimentation, we settled on pinching the tops within a week of transplant to encourage branching, then harvesting for the first time, essentially just by topping the central stem, when around 500 base 50 growing degree days had accumulated. Using this method, we found plants were ready for another harvest when around 500 more growing degree days had accumulated, 
And you continue this process with axillary shoots, which really take off after the first harvest. Using this system, plants in low tunnel plots were ready for the first harvest in as few as 15 days, and plants in open air plots were ready for the first harvest in as few as 20 days. Now let's take a look at a variety on the opposite end of the spectrum in a handful of ways. This is a dwarf variety called white leaf, and as you can see, the leaves are rounded and light green. White leaf is one of the least vigorous early growers we tested, and more than 650 base 50 growing degree days was the marker for our first harvest. This season, that meant a minimum of 21 days for first low tunnel harvest, and a minimum of 28 days for first open air harvest. Yields from the three production systems were all significantly different from one another. Beyond statistical significance, these differences could definitely be felt in a realistic way on a larger scale. There was a greater difference in yield between black plastic and bare soil than there was between black plastic and low tunnel. So for white leaf, black plastic is at least recommended, and crop covers could certainly be beneficial if they fit into your production strategy. Now, although white leaf takes longer to get established, it is super leafy. So we found that white leaf could be harvested again after around only 300 more growing degree days had accumulated. You can see here the scar from where the central stem was cut, and you can see how much growth the axillary shoots have produced. Lastly, we'll look at two moderately branched varieties that fall somewhere between the two we've discussed so far. As far as the harvest schedule and methods, we treated these two varieties the same. For both, we did our first harvest at under 600 cumulative growing degree days, and the second when under 250 additional growing degree days had accumulated. These varieties also had similar responses in that we found a significant interaction of the planting date, which is related to ambient temperature, and the production system. So in the middle of the summer, the difference in production system had less of an effect on the yields of both of these varieties. Here are some plants from satellite plots, and you can see that, again, if you cut the central stem, even pretty far down, you'll have plenty of remaining growth on those axillary shoots. The stems on those axillary shoots definitely elongate much more than the other two varieties, so we did see a decrease in leaf-to-stem ratio on the second harvests, but still plenty of tender leaves. So these varieties are vigorous growers, like taller varieties, but they're also really leafy, like our dwarf variety. So they're pretty versatile as far as harvesting methods. Some marketing notes on these two. Amaranth with red and green leaves like these are often associated with Eastern Asia, but this is one of the most common and most commercialized looks of vegetable amaranth. Types with more slender green leaves are predominant in Africa, among other places. So if you're interested in growing amaranth in the northeastern region, remember to put some real thought into target market. If you want more detailed information on the methods and findings of our research, one place you can find them is in the final report for this project. Thanks for joining us.